Well, hey there, guys. Greetings and salutations, and welcome back to the channel for another installment of Open Mic, the show where the mic is open. The floor is yours. What do you want to talk about? That is what we are here to discuss here. Uh, my name is John Campia. Good to have you guys here. And uh, yeah, we're going to take your questions. Now, this is kind of more of a laid back, relaxed version of the John Campia show. We're, we're glad you're going to be here. We're just going to hang out for the next hour and just chat, talk about movies and stuff, the topics you want to talk about. And I'm going to let you know, there's two different ways that you can get a topic or question uh, addressed here on the show. One of the ways is anytime, 24 hours a day, you're up at four in the morning and you got a question, you can go to our tip link at Stream Elements. There it is, streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip. That link is also down in the description of the video. You can send that at any time when we're not live. And when we are live, you guys can use the super chat feature in the live chat and send in a topic or question that way. And if it's appropriate to be addressed on this, you know, movie chat show, then we will address it here. Uh, good to have all you guys here joining me again. I am very excited about this weekend. Very excited about this weekend. Uh, and, and just, you know, this is the last open mic of this week because tomorrow um, we're going to do the John Campus show in the morning. Me, Ray, uh, Jonathan, and Rob. Uh, Chris Carr is going to be out of town for the next two days. So Rob's going to be on the show for the next two days. So me, Rob, Jonathan, and Ray are going to do the John Campus show tomorrow. And then as soon as the show is over, uh, we are hitting the road. Me and my wife, we're going to hit the road to Vegas. Now, Ann and I love going to Vegas, but it is my birthday weekend. It's not my birthday, but it's my. we're making this my birthday weekend. And so tomorrow night, we're going to get to Vegas and go right to T-Mobile Arena because we're going to watch my beloved Toronto Maple Leafs play the Las Vegas Golden Knights. And then the plan right now is the next day to go see, on Friday, to go see you 2 at the Sphere. And then Saturday, Ann wants to go back to T-Mobile Arena and see Bad Bunny. So we're going to do that. And then Sunday morning, we wake up, drive back to uh, Riverside, and then go to see Dune 2 in the evening. So I got Dune 2, you 2, Bad Bunny, and the Toronto God's team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, playing tomorrow night. So it's going to be a good, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to play some poker in there. I always do. Uh, maybe go to a club or something like that. But yeah, I'm excited about it. It's going to be a really good weekend, but I am equally as excited, equally, to hang out here today with you fine folks uh, as we talk about uh, some cool stuff. All right, so listen, before we get to your questions, which is the main thing that we do, uh, you know I like to start off every open mic kind of with a topic. And today's topic is about Madam Webb. But but no, we're not going to talk about how bad Madam Web is again. We've we've done that ad nauseum. But rather, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about like how bad is it? Like where does it rank? And I saw one of the websites. I'm trying to remember which one. It was one of the bigger websites today. Kind of posted their own like uh, it's a list of the ten comic book movies that actually have lower Rotten Tomato scores than Madam Web does. And I can't remember the list. But I thought, you know what? Because me and Jonathan were kind of talk, chatting about this a little bit. There are movies that I believe, comic book movies, that I believe are even as bad as Madam Web is. And boy, it's bad. Uh, I believe there are a couple of comic book movies that are even worse. Um, are even worse than Madam Web. And I thought we would discuss it here today. And I'm open to seeing any of you guys in the live chat to throw in some... Uh, some stuff. No King Daddy Goat. You know what? I'm not going to lie. I thought Green Hornet was going to be terrible. I remember even, I was sitting down with Seth um, um, and talking to him. I'm trying to remember when it was. Anyway, uh, so anyway, me and Rogan were sitting down and I remember I even told him, dude, I'll be honest with you. I thought this movie was going to suck. And he's like, you were one of those assholes. I thought the movie was going to be terrible. I said, yep, I thought the movie was going to be terrible. Now, I don't think The Green Hornet was great, but I didn't think The Green Hornet was all that bad. I didn't think it was all that bad. So there's that. But I'm curious to see in the live chat if any of you guys have some uh, thoughts. I've seen Batman and Robin. Uh, Lucas is saying you also like Green Hornet. See, I'm not alone. It's not bad. It's, it's not bad. I mean, it wasn't good enough to turn into a franchise or anything like that. But yeah, and you know what? Batman and Robin is not on my list. I know it's a horrible movie. I know a lot of people consider it to be maybe maybe the worst comic book movie ever made, but it's not on my list. Not on my list. All right. 
So which ones are? All right, you ready? Strapped in kids? It's going to be a bumpy ride. But here we go nonetheless. I'm going to start off with this. I said it in my out of theater reaction to seeing Madam Web. The one good thing about that I could say about Madam Web was that it wasn't quite as bad as Morbius. Now, this is going to be your mileage may vary, right? This is going to be up to personal taste and interpretation. Most of us agree these are both very bad films. I think most of us agree on that. But I give the slight edge in awfulness, the slight edge in awfulness to Morbius. And you know what? Maybe part of the reason that I give the slight edge in awfulness to Morbius is maybe it's because my expectations were a little bit higher. Because I thought the trailers for Morbius were fire. Like, I thought the trailers to Morbius were great. Jared Leto is an Academy Award-winning actor. I think I think he's a terrific actor. Um, and I thought there were... I love the designs. And so maybe the reason I, I found Morbius to be a little bit worse might be because my expectations were higher. That might be part of it. But for whatever reason, for me, uh, Morbius is worse than Madam Web. All right, I got three more. Three more for you that I think is worse than Madam Web. Now, this next one you guys will be able to guess because I have an unholy trinity of the three worst studio-produced wide-release Hollywood movies of all time. One of them is Battlefield Earth with John Travolta. One of them is The Highlander 2. And the third one of the worst big studio produced wide release Hollywood films of all time, and I believe, yes, is worse than Madam Web, is Halle Berry's Catwoman. And listen, I adore Halle Berry. I adore her. And who didn't love her Catwoman outfit? Come on. She, to this day, I think she's in her 50s at this point. To this day, she's still one of the sexiest women in the world. And she's an Academy Award winning actress. She's fabulous. And I thought there was a lot of potential. Oh, dude, did I think there was a lot of potential in that Catwoman movie. I really did. Had a lot of hope for it. I think a lot of people did. Academy Award winner Halle Berry getting into the comic book movies. Things. It, it, no, it, it really is. Again, not just one of the worst comic book movies. It is one of, I believe, the three worst films ever made in the history of mankind that were made by a big studio and had wide release. I'm sure there are many tiny, tiny little movies that are worse, but I mean, big studio movie with wide release, the three worst of all time, Battlefield Earth, Highlander 2, and Catwoman. So Catwoman is the second comic book film, I believe. And these are in no particular order, but these, it is the second comic book film that I would say is worse than Madam Web. Okay, so the one I'm saying is uh, Morbius. The next one I'm saying is Catwoman. The next one I'm going to bring up is too bad because it's in a series of films where a couple of them are really fantastic. One is not so good, and then one is completely horrible. I've just given you some hints. This this film that I this comic book movie that I believe is worse than Madam Web is part of a series where two of them were fantastic, one of them not so good, and then this one completely terrible. I'm not seeing anybody guess it in the live chat. Some people saying Blade Trinity, that is a truly awful movie too. Some people saying Spider-Man 3, nope. I got to go back to the OG himself. Christopher Reeve in Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, is one of those, how the hell did this movie even happen? Like, this is, this is the same Superman from You'll Believe a Man Could Fly. This is the same Superman from one of the truly all-time great comic book movies, Superman 2. I, I, I still believe I got Superman 2 still my top 20 all time greatest comic book movies ever made I with, with Zod and all guys. Fantastic. Superman peace. Uh, Quest for peace. Lex Luthor takes a strand of Superman's hair 
and launches it to the sun. And it comes back as a fully grown man uh, with Superman's powers and all that kind of stuff. It's just awful. It's so bad. And I would contend it is worse than Madam Web. Maybe again, because it had bigger expectations. It was coming off a, a history success. I don't know what it was, but just this movie is so unbelievably painfully bad. I believe that even though Madam Web is one of the worst comic book films of all time, that Superman 4, Quest for Peace, is there. Um, you know, some people are mentioning this one. Uh, Rena for Gordon, for example, is saying worse than Fantastic Four, the recent one. Listen, I'll tell you what, Fantastic Four was really bad, but Fantastic Four won't be on the list of the worst of all time because the first act of that Miles Teller Fantastic Four was actually pretty good. I, I've told this story before, but I remember... Me and uh, Harloff, we went to a press screening on the Fox lot for fa this Fantastic Four. <clears throat> and they were playing the movie, and we were all expecting it to be terrible. Like, we, everybody was expecting it to be terrible. And I remember, like, one-third of the way through the movie, we're, we're almost near the end of the first act. I remember Harloff and I turned to each other, and we're like, what's, like, what's going on? This isn't that bad. The, the first act of that new Fantastic Four movie wasn't that bad now it got really bad in acts two and three but so that alone keeps it off this list all right now we get into the fourth comic book movie that uh i believe is the worse than madam webb okay so we're already covered jared Lodo's morbius christopher reeves quest for peace halle berry's catwoman now, I have not seen any of you in the live chat. I've seen a lot of names being thrown out there, but I haven't seen any of you mention this one. Obviously, Steel is really bad. Absolutely, culture. Steel is really bad. Spawn CJ Rebirth was absolutely dreadful. 100% dreadful. Wonder Woman 84 was very bad, but I, I wouldn't say in the top five worst ones of all time. Ghost Rider 2. Also, I wouldn't put in the worst of all time. X-Men Apocalypse, a bad film, but not, you know, the worst of all time. Howard the Duck, dreadful, but to me, not the worst of all time. And none of you have got it. <laughs> well, you know what? Thunder Force, Tyler, would be on the list, except it is not a comic book movie. It is a superhero movie, but it's not a comic book movie. So, <clears throat> otherwise, Thunder Force would be on this list. Thunder Force is truly one of the worst films I've ever seen. Somebody in the live chat got it. Somebody in the live chat got it. Fetman plays. Guessed it. It's Jonah Hex with Josh Brolin. Jonah Hex with Josh Brolin. And I'll tell you what. Um, this movie is beyond pure garbage. It's so bad that they couldn't even find enough good material to make a truly full-length feature film. You know, most movies today, you know, about probably about two hours, bare minimum, bare, bare minimum, 90 minutes, right? Jonah Hex was 81 minutes long. They couldn't even make enough stuff <laughs> to make the film even 90 minutes long. And it's 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 awful. And <clears throat> I, I'm not going to go into all the details, but I had a front row seat into the, some of the development of this movie and the chaos that ensued behind it and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, 81 minutes long. Now, there are other movies being made, like Electra. Electra was bad, but uh, again... It was, it was really bad, but not like all-time terrible. Steel definitely contended to be on this list. Where did it go? There it is. Steel definitely contended to be on this list of movies worse than Madam Web. Uh, the Spirit um, is another one that contended to be on this list. That was one of the ones that I was really hard considering. Um, yeah, so a whole bunch of these things. So, again, I submit to you, 
my brothers and sisters in film fandom, that the four comic book movies that have been made that are all worse than Madam Web in this dubious honor is Jonah Hex, Catwoman, Superman for the Quest for Peace, and I would say Morbius. So, and, and, and a number, you guys have brought up a number of other strong contenders. Strong contenders. Uh, Shia was saying the most recent Hellboy, again, the most recent Hellboy movie was a disappointment. It wasn't very good, but not like iconically awful. You know what I mean? It was bad, but not like iconically awful. So there's that guys. Those, that's my list for the movies now. And, and some of you probably think there are a couple of others. So I think it's always, to, it's good to look on the bright side. It's healthier in life. It's, it's, it's a, you're going to have a happier life if you try to look on the bright side. So we can continue to talk about how bad Madam Webb is. Or we can look on the bright side and say, well, you know what? It wasn't Jonah Hex. Yeah, Madam Webb was terrible, but you know what? It wasn't Catwoman. Yeah, it was bad. Oh, my God, it was bad. But you know what? At least it wasn't Superman for the quest for peace. Or some other ones that you guys might have so and i'm sure you guys have more films that you can probably think of that you'd throw up in there um but listen guys for now we're gonna go over and start taking your questions because that after all is the primary thing that we are here to do today so let's get things started here shall we we're gonna start off things with scott brown who wrote avatar the last airbender live action coming out comes out tomorrow my friends i have I just have zero interest in these live action remakes of animated movies or series, especially when they're shot for shot. I mean, what's the point? It feels a bit disrespectful to animation. And I'm, am I alone? I, what? I, look, look, Scott, I have no problem that you don't have any interest in live action, anima, uh, live action interpretations of animated films. That's fine. That's cool. You're not alone. Nothing wrong with that. But how is it disrespectful to animation? Is it disrespectful when they make an animated stuff out of a live action thing? Like a lot of people grew up loving the the Ghostbusters animated show, right? <clears throat> that was a translation coming off of the movie. I mean, that wasn't disrespectful to live action. Um, no, I, I think it's... Um, no, nah, I, I, I think... I don't see any logic to saying that it's disrespectful. No, it's not. It's a new interpretation. It's a new iteration, right? And it is very rarely, it's never shot for shot. The only movie I can ever think of in my life that was truly shot for shot was <clears throat> an adaptation of a graphic novel, and that was Sin City. Sin City was the only thing that I can think of that was a true shot for shot translation. Now, again, I, I have no problem with the fact that, hey, listen, live action uh, remakes of animated stuff does not interest you, doesn't float your boat. Gotcha. No problem. That's a perfectly valid point of view to have. I don't share it, and that's fine. That's perfectly. But the idea that it's disrespectful? No, it's not. No, it's not. Not in the least. And there have been some great Live action translate. I personally think One Piece, the live action, is better than the animated thing. Don't what's the what's the phrase? Don't at me. Whatever. Yeah, don't come at me. I don't care. I thought I thought One Piece. I, and I saw a couple of episodes. I, after seeing the live action One Piece, I decided to give the animated thing a shot, and I'm like, nah, this isn't for me. I personally thought the live action was better. But <clears throat> anyway, that's just me. All right, let's keep going on. Thanks for that, Scott. Uh, next up, Scott Allsports. I don't think some things lend themselves to live action. I don't disagree with that. Uh, especially things that are fantastical. Oh, I don't agree with that. Uh, example, He-Man. They have been trying to do another live action He-Man for 25 years. Why not just do an $80 million budget animated movie like Spider-Verse? Well, because no one's going to go see it. No one's going to go see it. No one's going to go see an $80 million uh, He-Man animated film. He-Man is not Spider-Man. If you're going to try to do He-Man... Uh, you you do something new. And, I, and listen, there have been so many people for so long that have wanted to see He-Man brought to life, <clears throat> right? They want to see He-Man brought to life. And the Dolph Lundgren thing, no, that doesn't really count. Um, I think the fantastical stuff really lends itself. Listen, there's an argument to be made, Scott Brown, that Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings was a remake of an animated film. The animated 
Lord of the Rings stuff came out decades before Peter Jackson did his thing. They were both based on the book, yes, but the animated came first. I mean, look, the basic thing is this. Anything can be a great live action thing. All you got to do is start with a story. And then once you have that story, develop it into a good movie to watch. Right? That, that's the thing. It doesn't matter if the original story came from a book. It, do, it doesn't matter if the original story came from a cartoon show. It doesn't matter if the original idea came from a writer sitting in a coffee shop and had a random thought. Right? It doesn't matter. All movies come from an idea. Right? An idea. Whether that idea came from a book, cartoon, comic book, older movie, older TV show, an original thought in a coffee shop, doesn't matter. All movies come from an idea. And then it's all about how do you develop that idea? How do you develop it? Do you develop it well? Do you put thought and imagination into it? Do you construct well-fleshed out characters? All that kind of stuff. <clears throat> because to say that fantastical stuff won't translate well to live action well then then that's saying that there's no fantastical live action movies and that's clearly not true right it's clearly not true so it can be good it can be bad all that kind of stuff but it's it's all got to come from someplace and then it's all about how you develop it now now i agree that i think there are some animated animated stuff whether they're animated films or animated shows that are done in such a way that it's just not really practical to do it in live action. I would agree with you on that. I think we can see eye to eye on that. But I, I don't think that's a truism across the board. You know what I mean? I, I think almost anything, almost anything can be taken and if translated right, can be turned into a good live action film. That's just me. But I appreciate you sharing your thoughts on that, Scott. Thanks for that, man. All right. <clears throat> Next up. Oh boy, Madam Webb writes... If I'm not mistaken, you used a hypothetical example a while back called Felipe the Sentient Dancing Microphone. Yes, I did. To explain how great writing can turn a silly premise. We were just talking about that. To explain how great writing can turn a silly premise into a great overall story. Well, Madam Webb sounds like the reverse of that. Yeah, so here's the thing. I have this... I, I, I once made up this fictitious character. Uh, let's, let's see... I'm going to see if I can find a, an image of it. Uh, I'm not sure that I can. Oh, my God. Yes, it is. I was able to look it up and find it online. So <clears throat> somebody made it and put it up online. So the basic idea of this, one of our, one of our viewers made this image and sent it into me once. The basic idea behind Felipe the Sentient Dancing Microphone is I, I was often getting hit with a lot of questions about, hey, John, if they did something like that, do you think it could work? Or John, uh, do you think a, I, a movie about this could work? And here's the thing. My answer is always, when you're asking the question, could it work? The answer is always yes, right? It's always yes. Could it work? It could, right? Because I said, look, let's say you got, because uh, listen, they did they did a Lego movie, a movie about square, sharp, plastic building blocks, right? That is the stupidest, flattest, emptiest concept to start with to try to make a movie. But they made a brilliant movie out of it, right? So I made up this character. I said, look, anything... Any idea could be made into a great movie. I said, and then I just made it up on the spot. I said, I don't know. And I grabbed my microphone. I said, what if my microphone, like, I, what if I made a movie, my microphone coming to life? And we called the movie uh, Felipe, the sentient dancing microphone. He came to life, sings and dances. Okay. Stupid premise. Absolutely. But I contend if you have the right writers, the right director, the right development team, who, and then the right idea, Felipe, the sentient dancing microphone, as stupid as that is, could be, could, not will, but could, could be a fabulous, great idea and make a wonderful movie. It could. Not necessarily that it will, not necessarily that it's probable, but it could. And yes, you're, you're kind of right, man. The, the Madam Web... <laughs> It's kind of that in reverse. Start with a great idea and then kind of uh, 
kind of go completely the wrong way on it. All right, next up, we got Dangerous D who writes, on your last video, Alan Richens said that he wants to play Batman, so I want to nominate three other actors, Tom Ellis, Jensen Ackles, Scott Adkins. Um, Scott is, I think, a little too old to start playing Batman at this point. I mean, there was a period of time that a lot of fans believe Scott Adkins would be a great Batman. Um, Tom Ellis, I love him in Lucifer. I don't know that I see him as Batman. I think there's a lot I could see him as Bond. I could see him as a lot of different things. And I but I just don't know if I could see him as Batman. Jensen Ackles is a guy I've been a fan of forever. Like I've been a big big fan of Jensen Ackles and particularly of course with him being uh, in Supernatural, which is a show I watched um and loved Supernatural. He's great as Soldier Boy in The Boys Universe. I love him. Batman. I'm not sure. Uh, I need to look this up. How tall is Jensen Ackles? <clears throat> you know what? He's taller than I thought. I was going to peg Jensen Ackles at like 5'10 because Jared Padalecki is a giant. And so he always looks really short next to Jared Padalecki. But uh, Jensen Ackles is six foot one. You know what? That's that's not bad. I, I still have a hard time seeing him as Batman. Still have a hard time seeing him as Batman. But he's taller than I thought. Maybe. But I, I'm going to admit something, though. I would have a hard time. The way I've been seeing Jensen Ackles for the last 20 years, I have a hard time believing I could see him as a Bruce Wayne or Dark Knight. I don't know. Let's, let's put it this way. If they announced him tomorrow, if they announced him tomorrow as being Batman, I'd be on board. Wouldn't be my first choice. But if they said, hey, Jensen Ackles is going to be uh, Batman, I'd get on board with it. All right. Next up. Uh, Narf says, have you seen the trailer to American Society by Kobe Libby? Looks weird. I'll be honest with you, Narf, I've never even heard of it, <laughs> to be honest with you, so I have no idea. All right, next up, Nick writes, hey, John, what do you think is the better 80s movie? Fast Times at Ridgemount High, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Risky Business, Ridgemount High. Listen, they're all great, right? Ferris Bueller, it's funny, I just, I've been spending the last couple of weeks watching the uh, Twist and Shout segment from Ferris Bueller because it's been a part of uh, True Detective Night Country. Um, risky Business. Take them old records off the shelf. I mean, um, but for me, it's Fast Times at Ridgemount High. I was a very, very, very young kid when that movie, and I didn't get to see it in movie theaters. I had to, my, I think my friend got it on VHS or something. That that movie's a sexual awakening for kids watching. <laughs> I was a kid, but I was like, wow. Uh, but but even as I grew, old, oh, as tantalizing as Fast Times at Ridge, Ridgemount High was, um, as I grew older, um, I maintained my real love for it. I I, I mean, I, I my appreciation for just how good it was, um, kind of grew a lot. Spicoli? Yeah, I, I think I think the movie's great. I love it. Uh, Ferris Bueller's is great, obviously. Risky Business is great, obviously. But for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna go the way of Fast Times at Ridgemount High for that one. All right, guys, listen. We got more of your questions to get through, obviously. But before we do, we're gonna take a quick second and thank one of the sponsors of today's episode, my friends and mobile service provider. They should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. I've told you guys many times that after switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, Go to mintmobile.com slash 
Campia. That's mintmobile.com slash Campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for sponsoring today's episodes. All right. That down, guys. Let's get back to it here, shall we? We're going to have things picked up here with Dan, uh, BK Dan, who writes, John, I've done some freelance work for a role-playing game company. Nice. And as such, I'm uniquely suited to agree with Chris. I am the creative, quote-unquote, allowed to play in someone else's sandbox, the company being the studio in this case. I don't see how that's you agreeing with, with Stuckman's premise. Um, if anything, I think that makes that sounds more like you're agreeing with mine. You are creative playing in somebody else's play box, in somebody else's sandbox. Being somebody else's sandbox, that means they get to make the rules about what can and can't happen in their sandbox. Like, this goes back to, um, and I have this discussion with my friends and, and uh, fellow film fans all the time. There's this romanticized idea that uh, a director or writer filmmaker should want to make a movie and the lowly movie studios should just come groveling along and say, oh yes, oh sacred filmmakers, please take our money. Take all of our money and go do whatever you want. We don't care. Just do it. Just here's, please take our money. Do us the honor of taking our money and, and go do whatever your brilliant creative visions can manifest. It's stupid. It's a stupid, stupid, stupid idea. Hollywood is... And always has been a studio-driven business. A, a studio-driven business. Very, very true, King Daddy Goat. Unless your name is James Cameron. That's a, yep. <laughs> there, there are a couple of very, very rare exceptions. James Cameron, Steven Spielberg. Yeah, you know, th there'll be the exceptions. Even Martin Scorsese has got to go around and kind of knock on doors and and beg sometimes some studios to give him the money that he wants to do. But at, at any rate, but that's true of Hollywood and Hollywood history. The basic premise is is this, and I explained this in my analogy the other day. And all these people want to say, "No, well, your analogy doesn't apply." Oh, my analogy, goddamn well, applies. It's a hundred percent applicable. The analogy of a creative, skilled designer, interior designer, who wants, and I need somebody to come, I, I, I want my, my main floor, living room, bedrooms, recreation area, kitchen, I want it all redone, but I don't know what to do. So, but I know I've got a vision for my house and I talk to a designer and say, hey, I've got this main floor, nothing upstairs, nothing downstairs, but I got the main floor and I want it like a new vision brought to it. I'm thinking something bright, colorful that makes me feel like I'm, I'm on vacation while I'm there, right? So immediately the creative, the designer, is having to take my input because it's my fucking house. It ain't the designer's house. It ain't the creator's house. It's my fucking house that I got to live in and I'm paying for everything. So if you're going to come in with your creative brilliance and your hair flowing in the breeze... You're goddamn going to do what I want in there. Now, I'm trusting in your expertise. I'm trusting in your brains to come in with the ideas and to bring it all to life. But at the end of the day, it's my house. I'm paying for everything. And I got to be made happy with what I'm getting. So then the designer comes in and says, I got a vision for this bathroom. And I'm like, oh my God, that's great. Please do that. And they bring their vision to life. And they say, now I got this vision for your kitchen. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so good. Yes, you're so brilliant artist. You're so brilliant. Please go into my kitchen and do that. Here's all the money you need. And then they go in and they, they do that in the kitchen. But then they get to my, my, my living room. Then they get to my living room. And the, the creator says, uh, the, the visionary, the designer says, now, you said you want, uh, like, you're on vacation, so I want to have, like, wave blue on your walls. And I go, wait a minute, wait, 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 time out, time out, time out, time out. Like, what you're doing in here is great, and I love what you're putting together. Like, you, you're such a visionary. You're so good. You're so good. I love what you're doing. But, but, if I may give you a note, I don't like blue. Even though I do, personally, John Campia loves blue. But I'm just saying, for the sake of the discussion. And I say to the creator, 
I don't personally, I don't like blue. So I don't want blue in my living room. What's the designer going to do? Is the the designer going to go, what? You are questioning my creative vision? You're, you're, You're imposing your muggle opinion on on what i know to be a brilliant creation in your living room you're stepping on my toes creatively muggle i'm the chosen one i'm the creative genius or or is the designer if they're not an idiot going to go okay you know what that wasn't my vision i had a vision for blue in your walls but you want non-blue okay I will work with what it is you want because it's your house and you're paying for everything. And I will try to give you the best possible thing I can within those parameters. No blue on the walls. Gotcha. (coughs) And then ultimately they do it. And maybe some people would have thought blue would have been better on the walls, but it's my house and I'm happier with, I don't know, whatever, whatever color they decided to put on the wall right after that. That is not a different scenario from a filmmaker to a studio. The studio's like, we want this movie project done. Here's the basic vision for the movie. And, you know, they get the producer's director. Sometimes the producer's director is the ones who come up with the ideas, whatever. And the studio's like, okay, this is our movie. We're paying for it. All the money's coming from us. So go ahead, work your creative magic, work your creative vision. But there may be a time here and there where we're going to go, let me pull up my notes. I want to give you a note. That's great, but we don't want to shoot in Thailand. Okay, that's great, but we don't think we should have, I don't know, uh, the French as the bad guys in the film because we have a very specific release strategy in France and we don't want France to be the bad guys. Make somebody else bad guys. Is the filmmaker going to go, what? You're stepping on my creative toes, you muggle. I am the visionary. No, no, just just go and now make the best thing you can within those parameters. And that's the way it's been in Hollywood ever since the very beginning. Peter Jackson talked at length about how much... Now, when a movie turns out bad, they call it studio interference. When a movie turns out good, it's still the exact same thing, except they call it collaboration. When a movie's bad, the the fans call studio interference, studio interference. When a movie turns out great, even though it was the exact same thing, they call it collaboration. But Peter Jackson talked at length. We all agree how great the, the Lord of the Rings films are, right? Peter Jackson talked a lot about a lot of the notes that he would get from the studio and he would implement, uh, not all of them, not all of them. He pushed back on some and, and, and he won some of those fights. But Peter Jackson talked at length about the fact that he got a lot of notes from New Line and, and a lot of them made it into his film and he thought the movie was richer for it. He thought that his movies were better for it, for the collaboration, which if the movies turned out bad, we would be calling it interference, but because it turned out good, we call it collaboration. Anyway. And and should there be a limit to how much the studio gets involved? Yes, there should be a limit because it's like, well, why did you hire the designer in the first place? Like if I'm going to hire a designer to come in and redo my first floor, but I'm going to tell them everything to do, then what the hell did I hire the designer for in the first place? I do believe there should be a limit. Absolutely. But fans and creators and and filmmakers need to understand that there's still going to be a chunk of that, that you are going to and should take notes from the people paying for everything. For the people who then have to take that movie and try to sell it around the world. And if you don't want that, if you don't want any input from a studio and you don't want anybody to give you notes and you don't think the studio should have a single thing to say about your creation, then pay for the fucking movie yourself. Genius. Pay for it yourself. So anyway... That's just kind of my my thing on that and, and how I see it and all that kind of stuff. Should there be limits? Yes, but it's it's just the, the hypocrisy of it. When a movie turns out bad, we call it studio interference. When a movie turns out good, we call it collaboration. All right, next up. We got Stephen from Ireland. 
or Stefan from Ireland who writes, I don't know, is that, would that be Stefan or Steven? I'm going to go with Stefan for now. Anyway, uh, one of three. Hi all. Uh, and Ray John, I love this show. Thank you so much. And keep up the great work. Uh, do I live in a mere universe? Cause Chris Stuckman didn't actually review this movie. Well, yeah, we went over that yesterday. Uh, but reviewed something else within the movie business. Stop the press. Uh, usually, uh, these usual suspects do this all the time. Yes, they do. So where is the backlash? I will be kind here and say 50% of people who watch this video, uh, the message Chris was saying went straight over their heads as they don't understand what he actually said. I wonder what will be next worst movie ever made, maybe Deadpool and Wolverine, if the characters if the characters were women instead of being males. Yep. Uh, this is the world we live in. I love your two picks for the best horror movie. Uh, that is The Descent and American World from London. For me, Day of the Dead and The Thing. Those are two great ones. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that was the kind of basic thing of this, right? Like with the back, we, we went over this yesterday, but with the backlash, Chris Scott, all the backlash was all missing the point because the backlash was right. Was because here's the basic thing the backlash to Chris was basically, and I watched about seven or eight of these videos, was in Chris Stuckman's Madam Web review, he refused to be too negative about Madam Web or to be negative about the people who made it. The problem with that is that Chris Stuckman did not do a Madam Web review. He did an editorial video on what we were just talking about. He did an editorial video on studios imposing themselves into the creative process. Now, Chris and I have opposite views of that, but still, all these people who were giving Chris a hard time, it was like they were, they were jumping on him for not doing his Madam Web review right. But he said right at the beginning, this isn't a Madam Web review. He was using Madam Web as the base example for what his video was actually about. Studios imposing themselves into the creative process. That's what the editorial was. That's what the video was about. And I don't know why some of these Einsteins couldn't wrap their heads around that. Well, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. But that's not what this video was about. His video was about this. And he made a very, I mean, I disagreed with his with his, um, with where he landed in his conclusions, but he made a very good, thoughtful video expressing what he thought and why he thought it over around a topic that the video was about. And you're complaining about things that would apply to a different video that were not this video. Anyway, <laughs> um, so you're 100% right. You're 100% right about that, uh, Stephen or Stefan. So, I mean, Alton Wang, it's, it's, it's true. The internet, the internet runs on outrage. And here's the thing. When there's nothing to be outraged over, you want to look, if you want a really good telltale sign for somebody really weak-minded, and be careful because I think what I'm about to say has applied to all of us at some point, myself included. I, I, think, I think we've all fallen into this trap that I'm about to tell you about. I think we all have. But... <clears throat> If you want to know somebody is in a really weak position, look for this. When there's not even something to be mad about and they manufacture something to be mad about. Right? So an example of this. Somebody say, somebody gets uh, on the internet and says, uh, I would kill a kitten if the kitten became possessed by a demon from the seventh level of hell and threatened humanity. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, obviously I'm just pulling this out of my ass. So somebody gets on the internet and says, I would kill a kitten. If that kitten became possessed by a demon of the seventh level of hell and threatened the existence of all humanity. Okay. And then somebody makes an angry response video saying, how can that person say they would kill a kitten? That person hates kittens. What's your agenda against kittens? Hollywood is all about kitten killing. Yes, that's what Hollywood is about, kitten killing. It's like, oh my God. No, they didn't say they, they wanted to kill kittens. They said they would kill a kitten if that kitten became possessed by a demon of the seventh level of hell and threatened the existence of all humanity. So, yeah. So when you can't actually be mad at something, you manufacture something to be outraged at, right? A thoughtful person who actually listened to what Stuckman was saying 
You may disagree, and that's healthy. That's good. That can be a disagreement. You may disagree with a bunch of stuff he says, but there's nothing in what he said to be outraged over unless you were one of the Hollywood studios because he just basically, Stuckman spent 15 minutes dragging Hollywood studios over the coals, right? But So unless you're one of the Hollywood studios, there was nothing to be outraged over. A great example of this, um, a, a great example for this is, say, I, I, I've brought up this example before, um, this whole idea, like, Madam Web is terrible, right? Like, you're not going to find a lot of people who have been talking quite as much as I have about how bad Madam Web was, right? But then you get these... Uh, brain dead virgin club members who are like, it's woke. I'm like, wait, what woke? Let me see here. I did see the movie. I hated watching it, but I did see it. There was never one thing, not one thing in Madam web as terrible as the movie is. There is nothing in this movie where it's talked about. We can stop that man villain because we're girls and girls, Girls have the power and girls can do. There was no, none of that. There was literally nothing in the movie was that was like that. It just so happened that the characters were women. Yes, they were there. Oh my God, women are there? Yeah, they were there. But there was like nothing in it about women can be this and women are this and girl power. There was none of that in the movie. The rage baiters, they they don't they can't talk about that. There's 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 nothing there to rage over. So what they do is, well, girls are there. Woke. Why why why? What happened in the movie that that make you upset? What what was in the movie that was woke? Girls are there. Okay, fuck it, whatever. You're hopeless. Um. So, I mean, I get there are some movies and TV shows where that is there. I often talk about the uh, Supergirl show, right? That was on CW. Listen, I get it. If you watch Supergirl on CW, there was tons of that stuff in it, like, right? There was even this great scene between Supergirl and um, uh, Felicity. Uh, who's the girl that's married to Harrison Ford? Allie McBeal. Felicity, uh, help me out in the live chat. I don't know why I'm freezing on her name because she's great. But. <clears throat> Like, there were tons of these types of scenes in Supergirl where Calista Flockhart, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. It was Calista Flockhart, not Felicity. Why was I saying Felicity? Anyway, um, so there were plenty of scenes like this where Supergirl would be standing in Calista Flockhart's office and, uh, like, Calista Flockhart gives this big speech. What's wrong with Supergirl? I'm a girl, and as a girl, I can be this. The whole idea that a girl is that, and a girl is powerful, and a girl is this, and girly, 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 right? Listen, if you wanted to be something, if you wanted to be somebody to, to looking for the woke stuff, even though there was nothing wrong with it, but okay, I would see that. Like, yeah, they were preaching a lot of that in Supergirl. There was a lot of that in all the dialogue. It was presented very upfront and in your face in Supergirl. I don't think there was anything wrong with that they did that, but they did do it. And so, therefore, if you want to point at that and say, woke, okay, I'd go, yeah, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nothing wrong with it, but yes, yes, that was there. But none of that was in Madam Web, as bad as it was. As terrible as Madam Web is, none of that was there. None of it. But they need to manufacture things because their whole system of existence right now is based on rage and fear and cowardice and anger. And if there's not something there to be fearful and angry and raging about, make it up. Make it up because they only get clicks if they have rage. They only get people listening to their podcast or reading their blog articles if there's something to be angry about. That's the only way they can exist. And so they often manufacture and make it up, and it's quite frankly pathetic. Anyway, um, <clears throat> next up, we got uh, Huis Williams writes, Hey, John, with Morbius and Madam Web, do you still have confidence in the chances of success of Venom 3 November following Crave in October? 
The drop in box office, by the way, with the Venom film is $300 million. A first-time director at the helm. Again, <coughs> hoping for the best, though. My, and my um, optimism, my optimism for Craven has taken a big hit. Madam Web has caused my optimism, and, and some people may rightfully say that it was naive optimism to start with. Granted, I don't have an argument for that. You might be right. Maybe it was naive optimism, but it was optimism nonetheless. My optimism for Craven has taken a big hit. Yep, it really has. For Venom, not as much. Because it, it's still, I, I really, really liked what Tom Hardy and, and, and whatever did with the first Venom. Uh, I quite enjoyed the second Venom, even though I didn't like it as much as the first one. But I still enjoyed it. And while it's a first-time director, it is a very seasoned vet in the film business. And somebody who has been working closely with Tom Hardy in the previous Venom movies. So that's a mitigating circumstance for me because normally you know me. I, I get quite worried about first-time directors in, in larger films. Um, but in this particular case, it's somebody who has worked in the Venom films very closely with Tom Hardy, and they know this franchise as good as anybody. And it's not like Venom 3 is Avengers. It's not like Venom 3 is a new Star Wars film, right? It's a, it's, it's a smaller comic book film, but a comic book film nonetheless. So... <clears throat> We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Venom 2 was, was quite enjoyable to me. Venom 1 I loved. So I still have my optimism for Venom 3. But yeah, my, my optimism for Craven. I, I've been optimistic for a year. I've been optimistic about Craven for a year. But yeah, after seeing Madam Web, not as much. But still for Venom 3, we'll see how it all works out. All right, next up. Shekel Money writes, Hey John, big fan since the AMC days. Thank you so much. You mentioned Christian Harloff a lot of times, but I don't hear you talk about uh, other members of the panel like Mark Ellis and John Rocha. Uh, you always had such great chemistry with everyone. Well, I bring up Mark every once in a while. Like uh, Mark and I will will you know bump into each other and talk. We actually we we just ran into Vegas uh, at the same time not long ago and hung out and chat. The the thing is, <clears throat> um, I don't. Like Mark doesn't do what Christian and I do. Like Christian and I run our own YouTube channels. We run our we're, we're we're Christian and I are still in the same sphere, so we we intersect a lot and and talk a lot and stuff like that. We still talk shop and all that kind of stuff. So there's that. But like Mark's really not. I mean, he does. He's got a stand-up comedy. He does stuff with Rotten Tomatoes, but he's not doing his own thing. And and therefore, Mark and I don't intersect nearly as much. But I love Mark Ellis. I I think the dude is a unique talent. I think he's a wonderful guy. Just, just forget everything else. Mark Ellis is just a wonderful guy. A uh, truly, truly hilarious, um, hilarious dude. And, and yeah, he's fantastic. John Roca <clears throat> is just not really somebody, uh, he's doing his own thing and it's great to see him doing his own thing. But like Christian and I were like, we're friends, right? And uh, going back years. And while John Roke and I did some work together when he came over and did some work for us at, at Collider and maybe back in the AMC days, like, uh, and, and John's great, but we never like hung out. Like me and John Roke never hung out outside of work or stuff like that. Just like, I'm sure you have people you work with that you never hang out. You, you think they're great people, but you've just never hung out with them, right? So yeah, John uh, Roke and I, we've just, we never intersect. Uh, our paths never intersect. And so we didn't like hang out before and stuff like that, but I got a lot of respect for John. I love the fact that he's doing what he's doing. Like he's pursuing what he loves. He's, he's got his own YouTube stuff going. He's got a great show, uh, going obviously right now. And yeah, I mean, so yeah, that is just, that's just kind of that. So, I mean, the people I hung out with mostly was, uh, Harloff, Dennis, primarily, and I still hang out with Dennis from time to time. Uh, it's Dennis and I would hang out more, except we live about an hour and a half apart from each other now. Uh, Schnepp, stuff like that. But uh, but yeah, so that's uh, that's that. All right, next up, 
Uh, let's see here. Shuckle Money again watch uh, says, just a suggestion, you should add your stream element link in your video's information. It's there. It's there in all of our videos. It's down a little ways, but the link is there in all of our videos. Uh, where you put the link to your podcast, uh, where are the links for submitted topic? We don't have links for submitted topic anymore. Um, <clears throat> there... Now, if you want to submit a topic, you do it through the uh, Mint Mobile hotline. We may change that. We might change that again in the near future. I'm not really sure yet, uh, but that change could be coming. But as far as the um, the actual link, it is in our videos. It's it's down the again. You got to scroll down a little bit, but it is there in all of our videos. Okay, that's all the tip link questions. Now we're going to go over to your live questions that you guys have been sending in here. And as we do, I'm going to turn off the Super Chats because I think we got just about as many uh, Super Chats as we can handle right now. So give me a second and I'll turn those off. I don't want today to turn into another three-hour stream like it was yesterday. All right. <clears throat> Let's go over to it and get to your live questions that you guys have been sending in here. Okay, where's where am I? Here I am. All right. Next up. Now, unfortunately, the way our display, we're having a problem with our third party software that displays the super chat. So the way I have to have it formatted right now, you can't see the name of the person who sent in the question, but I will call out the name of the person. All right. This first one comes to us from Jared, who writes, um, is Harley Quinn as popular as some fans think she is? Yes, she is. Uh, she's a side character to a side character with two movies and a recent game with her hev with her heavily involved that flopped hard. What do you think? Well, <coughs> um, the game has nothing to do with it. I mean, there have been games with super popular characters that don't do well. That has game has nothing to do with it. That's not the realm we're in here. Her Suicide Squad movie that she was one of the the big characters in was released during a pandemic and put out day and date release on HBO Max. What, what are you going to do? That there, there, nothing you can do about that. As far as um, the fabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, I it didn't I, I didn't like that movie. It's one of the only DC EU films that I didn't like. Um, let me see if I can find the box office for it. I'm having a hard oh, second. Oh, that's because I didn't search for box office. Give me a second. But I think it did better than it deserved. Uh, now, listen, a lot of people like that movie. That's fine. I appreciate that. But the movie made over $200 million. The movie made on, on a budget of 84. So, <clears throat> I mean, it, it didn't flop hard, but it wasn't profitable either. So, yeah. And then in the first Suicide Squad movie, the first Suicide Squad movie that she was in made all the money in the world. And listen, I, I will, I will tell you this. Let me actually, it was well over 700. Um, let me see, Suicide uh, Squad. Let me see if I can find it here. So the 2016 Suicide Squad movie, I mean, dude. Oh, you can't really see it. That's okay. But this Suicide Squad movie made two or 700. See if I can bring it in a bit. I can't, that's okay. But $749 million at the box office. And I will tell you right now, the main reason for that was Harley Quinn. You had Will Smith in it, definite draw. You had other people in there, definite draw. Um, but people wanted to see Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. And it made $750 million. And then the one she did after that, I, I mean, you really can't compare it to anything it, it got released day and date during a pandemic and put on hbo max for free at the same time um so yeah i mean no so i don't think people think harley quinn and by the way you the one of the big things you left out there she's got a smash hit television show it's animated granted but it is still a smash hit television show that's been running what four seasons now are they on the fourth season of um the harley quinn show can't remember exactly, but I, th I think it's like the fourth season or something like that. I love that show. It's great. So, no, I would disagree. I would disagree that people um, overestimate how popular. I think the character is very, very popular. <clears throat> I think the character is very popular. All right. Thanks for writing that in, Jared. Next up, 
HV3 writes, I watch movies differently than most people. The stuff that bothers other people just doesn't bother me. I really like Madam Web and Argyle. Great. Listen, that's I, listen, I preach this all the time. Movies are art. And art is subjective because art is experiential and all of us experience art in a different way. Because we all have different personalities, we all have different backgrounds, and we all have different experiences, and therefore a piece of art is going to hit you in a way that is different than the way it hits me. For some of us, it may hit us in a more positive way. For others, it'll hit us in a negative way. If you watched Madam Web and you took in the experience of that art, and it hit you in such a way that gave you a positive experience, you don't need to apologize for that. Nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that you, you don't have good taste. Or do, none of that nonsense. It just means, listen, everybody, everybody, everybody watching this video right now has a movie that everybody hates that they love. Everybody does. They're just too, most people are too scared to admit it. But the fact is, everybody has two, three, four, five, six, seven movies that they really like, that everybody else seems to hate. Also, everybody has two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten movies that they really hate that everybody else seems to love. Nothing wrong with that. It's the subjectivity of film. It's the nature of the art. And if you like those movies, you like those movies. I don't have to agree or have the same opinion for us to still like each other and get along. All right. Thanks for sharing that, HV3. Next up, <clears throat> we've got... Wesley Cunningham, who writes, Welp, just realized in about two months, Captain America Winter Soldier would have released 10 years ago. Wow. I'm going to go have a third life crisis now. Man, I'll tell you what. I still remember. I still remember um, coming out of watching Winter Soldier for the first time and being so thoroughly blown away. I was with uh, Roth. I, I think, yeah, I went to go see the movie with Roth. You guys remember Roth Cornette. And so Roth and I, I remember we came out of the theater having watched Winter Soldier. And we were just like, what did we just witness? Like, what did we just witness? And it's not a surprise. Now, it's not in my top three mo greatest comic book movies of all time. But it's not a surprise. That a lot of people, when you ask them for the best comic book movie of all time, there's a lot of film fans out there who will say Winter Soldier. Or at least have it in their top three, stuff like that. It's such a great movie. But yeah, that's kind of crushing Wesley. That's <laughs> turning 10 years old. That doesn't feel 10 years ago. All right, next up. We got Rob Battenbat, who sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you, Rob Battenbat, for that. And Rob Battenbat writes... Uh, thoughts on report that some WB insiders are saying they believe that Zaslav could buy, sell, or merge with another company in April, uh, which is why he could be signing all these big names like Cruz and Margo to sweeten the deal. Um, but you got to remember those deals that Zaslav is signing are not exclusive deals. Tom Cruise is signing a production deal with Warner Brothers, but he's still going to make movies with Paramount, and he's still going to have he still has other projects he's doing other other places. Um, and none of these are exclusive deals. So, so that's really nothing to do with it. Listen, David Zaslav himself said, we did a story about it on the John Campy show a month ago, two months ago, where David Zaslav during an earnings call said, we've steadied our finances. We got Warner Brothers to a place now that it's stable financially. And now we are moving, Zaslav said, we are moving out of the cost cutting stage and we are now ready to look at acquisitions. And we talked at the time when he mentioned that he's now looking at acquisitions. And that got a lot of people believing. And I still believe that he's looking at Paramount. There's not a lot of reports or headlines about Warner Brothers being the big people making offers for Paramount. But I 100% believe that he is strongly looking at Paramount. Because we know Paramount, and I love Paramount, by the way, but from everything we're reading, they are ripe to be either uh, a subject of a merger or of a, or, a, or of a purchase. So, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of, so in a way, Rob, that's kind of old news. Like, as I've said, we're moving into a period now for acquisitions. So we'll see. We'll see, Rob, if, if this actually manifests into anything 
or if it doesn't turn out to be anything at all, but we'll see where they go with that. And again, Rob, supporting us, $20 Super Chat. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate the sport, man. And uh, thank you for that very much. All right, <clears throat> next up, we've got uh, YT who writes, have fun in Vegas, John. Thank you. And enjoy Dune Part 2. Are you doing an out-of-the-theater reaction? And are you guys going to Simicon? Yes and yes. I 100% will be doing an out-of-the-theater reaction. Hopefully it's not one of disappointment um, on Sunday night when I get out of seeing uh, Dune Part 2. So keep your uh, eyes open for that. And 100% I am going to Cinemacon. I don't know if I'm bringing anybody else this year. Listen. <clears throat> um... I going, bringing somebody to CinemaCon is an expensive proposition because the hotel rates, uh, are up a little bit because you got CinemaCon coming in. So it's expensive. I mean, it's always expensive to get a hotel in Vegas, but depending on where you stay, I suppose, but you know, the CinemaCon happens in Caesar's palace. So getting a, a hotel in Caesar's palace is not a cheap, uh, undertaking. A lot of times I'm paying for the food for everybody when they go and eating out in Vegas is not the cheapest proposition. And then just the ticket. The t one ticket for CinemaCon. Any of you guys remember? Because I, I mentioned this last year, I think. Do any of you guys remember how expensive the ticket is to go to CinemaCon? <clears throat> Throw it all on in there in the, in the live chat. I'm keeping seeing if any of you guys know how much it costs to buy a ticket to go to CinemaCon. Ah, Vixter gets it right out of the gate. Vixter gets it right out of the gate. It's uh, $1,200 for one ticket. <clears throat> so um, I am definitely going. 100% I'm going to go. Whether or not I bring anybody else, I'm still not sure. Um, because it's, it's, it's expensive, man. It's, and I'm the one who's got to pay for it. And it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure... Because at the end of the day, after you can, after you take into consider transportation, the 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 pass, hotel, um, you're, you're looking at about twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars for each person that I bring. Um, and Junkbox writes, "Wouldn't it be a tax write off? Do you understand how a tax write off works? Like a lot of people think that a tax write off basically means it's free, right?" You spend it and you get all that money back in tax. No, no, no. That's not how a tax write-off works. That's not how, ta like everybody seems to think there's so many people who thinks, like people who don't own their own business thinks a tax write-off basically means it's free. No, no, no. No, no, no. It, it helps reduce your tax burden a little bit. But people think if you spend $2,000 on something that's a tax write-off, you save $2,000 in taxes. Nope. That, that is not how it works. If I spend $1,000 on something, it probably will get me about a $300 reduction in how much taxes I have to pay. I'm still on the hook for that $700. So, so if I paid like $3,000 for somebody to go to CinemaCon, I might get a $900 break on my taxes, but I'm still out that other $2,100. So... It's just something you got to keep in mind. You still have to pay for it and then you get a little bit of it back. So again, I just always come across people who think if it's a tax write-off, that kind of means it's free. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> That's not how it works. But so yes, it is, it would be a tax write-off, but I would still have to put up the $3,000 now and then in a year hopefully have to pay $900 less, but I still had to put up 3000. You know what I mean? So it's, it's uh woo. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a tough one. It's, it's tough. So I might end up taking one person. I might end up taking two. I haven't figured it out yet or decided, but, um, I am at least myself going. We'll see if I bring anybody else along with me. All right. <clears throat> Next up. Uh, we've got, uh, John Redcorn, who writes, how's Marvel slowing down when there are six MC oh gosh, okay. How's Marvel slowing down when there are six MCU projects coming next year? Cap 4, Thunderbolts, Fantastic Four, uh, Blade, uh, Daredevil, and Ironheart. Making the same mistakes. No, no, John, John, John. Oh. 
Okay, listen to me. <clears throat> you know how I'm always saying that when a major decision is made, like the changing of a CEO or, or something like that, I often say it's going to take like a year and a half to two years, sometimes three years before we actually feel and see the ramifications of that change. You know, like James Gunn took over as CEO of DC and then Flash came out saying, oh, well, James Gunn's failing already. Flash, blah, blah, blah. No, no, wait a minute. Don't, you don't understand. James Gunn had nothing to do with Flash. We're going to have to wait a couple of years until Batman or until Superman Legacy comes out to start to see the, the impact and the results of the leadership change, blah, blah, blah. So when Bob Iger came out and said, we are going to start to cut back on how much we put into production, right? Everything you just listed was already at various stages of production. Cap 4 had already shot most of it, and they had, they had to reshoot a bunch. Thunderbolts was already well into its development stage. It, just, it hadn't started rolling cameras yet, but casting, contracts, the writing, uh, visuals, uh, set construction, design, cost, like they we were already way far down the road on the development of that. That was already coming. Fantastic Four is something they literally announced four and a half years ago. And it were in various stages of development. They had all the deals done. They were well into pre-production. Blade, I mean, we know how long that's been going. Daredevil already started shooting. Ironheart is done shooting. I mean, so yes, Bob Iger said, we are going to start to reduce how much we make. But when he said that, there was already a whole bunch of stuff already in the pipeline. That was already there. It's already there. It's already in the process of being made. So when Bob Iger says, we're going to start to reduce how much we make, we're going to start to cut down on how much we put in that pipeline. Well, you got, you got to get the stuff in the pipeline out first, right? We weren't going to see the results of Bob Iger saying we're going to cut back right away. You're not going to see that result. They've already got all this stuff at various stages of production. They got to get that out. And then what's going to happen is you're not going to see another year, at least for a while, that they have five or six things come out in the same year. Like it's going to be a while before you see that again. What we'll probably see is three, four, maybe on an odd one, we might see five. Like one year they had two movies coming out, but they happen to have three shows that come out, whatever. But you're not going to see a year where they got six things come out again. But for now, they got to get what they got on their plate cleaned off. Then once they have what's already on their plate and already in development and already in production, once all that is cleared out and it's had its run, you're going to see them have fewer things in the pipeline moving forward. So, <clears throat> yes, they are not making the same mistakes. They are completing what they had already started, and then they will start things at a slower pace following that. So, so that's what they mean by that, John. All right, guys, listen. Uh, we still got more questions to go, but before we get to them, we're going to take another quick second here and thank another sponsor of our show this week, our friends Delicious over at Factor. We want to take a second and thank a sponsor of today's video, Factor. You know, guys, some days it's great to prepare your own meal, but some days it's great to have wonderful, delicious meals already ready to go. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals makes eating better every day easy. Wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. They've got snacks, smoothies, and more. Discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day like breakfast, midday bites, and more. And guys, you get to save. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. So guys, head to factormeals.com slash camp Campia50 and use the code Campia50 to get 50% off. That's code Campia50 at factormeals.com slash Campia50 to get 50% off. And thank you to our friends at Factor for sponsoring today's episode. 
All right, guys, let's get back over to your questions here, shall we? We're going to pick things up with Tim, who writes, I can't wait for Avatar, hoping it'll be good. Dude, it comes out tomorrow. The only thing that sucks about my Vegas trip is I'm not going to be able to watch Avatar tomorrow. I really am excited to watch it. Uh, we're talking about Avatar The Last Airbender, not James Cameron's work. Um, yeah, because, I, again, I'm doing the show, then immediately hitting the road, going to be on the road for three and a half hours, get into Vegas, uh, get settled into the room for a bit, and then head right over to T-Mobile Arena to go watch the Leafs play. So maybe late tomorrow night, as, I'm, as Ann and I are laying in bed, I'll pop open the iPad and we'll watch Avatar. Hopefully, hopefully. All right. Uh, next up, we got Raymond Verada who writes, SAG Awards this weekend, Giamatti or Murphy? I am sticking with my guess. Now, we're not talking about Oscars. We're talking about the SAG Awards. I'm going to stick with my guess that Giamatti wins Best Lead Actor. Um, I think, uh, and I have no problem with that because I think Killian Murphy and him both turned in remarkable, remarkable, remarkable performances. Uh, we've seen Giamatti win a couple of the awards this award season. We've seen Killian Murphy win a couple of the awards. Killian Murphy just won the, the BAFTA, the most recent one. So... <clears throat> It'll be interesting. I'm going to lean Giamatti. So, I mean, I wouldn't put any money on that because I think it's so close. But I'm going to lean Giamatti, and then who knows what's going to happen at the Oscars. No idea. All right, next up, we got Eddie Burton, who writes, Variety just reported a merger or sale of Warner Brothers and 2025 Universal. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Uh, with all the acquisitions going on, is it possible we'll end up with two to three studios left? That's not a good sign for the industry, in my uh, opinion. Well, first of all, no, they didn't. And uh, I, that, I mean, I'm, I'll go and check right now. I'll go and double check right now, but I'll tell you they didn't do that. You said Variety? Okay, Variety.com, top stories. Nothing in here about Warner Brothers merging with Comcast. So no, they didn't. Um, now, but as, as far as to your bigger point uh, about, you know, we've seen merger and acquisition, right? We saw Disney take over Fox. Um, there's talks of, of other things happening. We're seeing things like Fox and WB and Disney combining efforts to make the granddaddy of all sports streaming apps. By the way, Fubo is taking them to court to try to stop them from being able to do that. We'll see what happens. I'm pretty sure you can't stop. You, you can take them to court to try to stop a merger. You can't. I don't think you can take people to court to stop them from working together. But I, I don't know. We'll see how that turns out. Um, now, what if Comcast buys WB? Uh, would, okay, if Comcast buys W, uh, Warner Brothers, it would be on the condition of spinning off NBC Universal. Eh, maybe, but I, I mean, Comcast loves NBC Universal. I don't know why they would take WB over NBC Universal. I don't know. Look, there's a lot of stuff up in the air. What I do know is that Warner Brothers has just, just recently said they're actually looking to acquire other things, not be acquired. Uh, Paramount is in financial, is in an interestingly precarious position right now, right? We could be in a position where we're going to have fewer major studios, stuff like that, maybe. And is that ultimately good for the industry? Maybe not. But listen, what, like, what are they going to do if, and I'm talking hypothetically here, but if Paramount is going broke, then would I rather see Paramount get acquired by a Warner Brothers or by a Comcast? Or would I rather Paramount just disappear and go bankrupt? I think I would rather see them um, uh, get acquired. I think I would rather see them get acquired. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that all goes. All right. Next up. We've got... Um, Murray Reich writes, despite the 2023 box office disappointments of R-rated comedies, movies like Joyride, No Hard Feelings, and Strays, are we still, though, going to get more of these types of movies in the future, or is it dead? I think we will, because a lot of these movies were made for very, 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 very cheap. By the way, guy, I don't know why more of you didn't see Joyride. I don't know why you didn't listen to me and Rob and Chris and everybody. Joyride is comedy gold 
if you want to sit down and just laugh your ass off, I mean, it's all subjective and, and maybe it doesn't make you laugh because comedy hits us all in different ways. But I am, I, oh, Joyride is so freaking funny. <clears throat> so good. But if you can continue to make these things like for really, really cheap, Bottoms was another one. I didn't see Bottoms. I got to get around to watching that. But Bottoms was another one of those, right? Maybe they didn't blow up the box office, but it was made really inexpensively. Like, really, really cheap. And so it didn't have to do much. Oh, Patrick just bought Joyride for five bucks an apple. Good on you. Go support that movie because it's freaking hilarious. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of that going on. So I think they will continue to make them. You know, it used to be, here's where it could have be a, a changing trend. It used to be if you had some filmmaker that had, like, no money but they wanted to make something, they would make horror. I'm not bashing on the horror genre, by the way, horror people will tell you this, right? That for a lot of people for many years, horror was a great entry point because you could make really, really inexpensive, cheap movies and, and make horror and hopefully make something good, right? I wonder if comedy, like R-rated comedy will become that too. It's like, hey, you got next to no money for a movie, but you got a little bit of money, make an R-rated comedy. Um... You can go uh, crazy with that. So I wonder if we'll, we'll see a, a movement like that. I don't know that we will, but I would like to see that. It'd be pretty cool. All right. Thanks for that, Murray. Next up, <clears throat> we've got Connor Dorian, who writes, Did you see that Stephen King is calling out Warner Brothers Discovery for holding out Salem Lot's uh, review? Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? He can call out anybody he wants. By the way, I love Stephen King. He's, a, he's the man. But who, who cares what he calls out it doesn't matter it's irrelevant the studio is going to do what they think will make them the most money that's their job that's what they have to do and if they think holding salem's lot is going to make them is going to position them to make more money it's their call to do so we'll see all right john mckinley writes as bad as the not so amazing spider-man 2 was i still think spider-man 3 is one of the worst movies i've ever seen it's it's bad i mean it's, it's i don't think it's one of the worst movies i've ever seen but it's bad uh, I walked out of the theater uh, during when he danced in the streets. Yeah, that became like an instant meme, right? That became like an instant meme uh, for that. Uh, that 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 Tobey Maguire. It it became, it's like the ultimate comic book movie meme that's ever been done and made. It, it's it's kind of crazy. Yeah, Spider Man Three is not great. Spider Man Three is not great, and I know everybody. I love Sam Raimi. Like, see, he, he gave me, a he, Sam gave me a gift that is, like, one of my most prized things. But anyway, uh, I love Sam Raimi. He's terrific. Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, like, everything else he's done. But Spider-Man 3 is a bad film. That was his bad day at the office. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday. A lot of people will try to make an excuse and go, well, that was because of studio interference. How? Because they made him put Venom in the movie. So make a good movie with Venom in it. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, the studio says we want Venom in our movie that we're paying for. Okay, reset. Put your mind, put your genius, Sam Raimi, your genius mind to work, and now come up with a really good story and come up with a really good movie with Venom in it. What's what's that? Who's that guy that does uh, th that does the um, the videos about things that look should be obvious? And he goes. Who is, who, what's that guy's name? I, do you even know who I'm talking about? Maybe I'm going, maybe I'm the only one to watch it, but he does all these great videos about like, he'll, he'll take a video of somebody doing something in some weird way. And then he does it in a total simple way and goes, and he doesn't even speak. Cabby. Is that his name? I love that guy. <laughs> that, that, I, I love that guy. That guy is awesome. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got. Okay, they're they're telling you they want Venom in the movie. Okay, so make a good movie with Venom in it. Not that it's easy to make a good movie. Not not that it's easy to make. It's it, it's very 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 difficult to make a good movie. But you, I, I don't I don't give Sam who I adore. I love Sam Raimi. I love his work. I love him as an artist. Um, but I, yeah, you you don't you can't give him a pass because well Sony made him put Venom Venom in okay a lot of movies make filmmakers put certain characters in, and it turned out great. The studio forced Joss Whedon to put Black Widow in Avengers 
when he wanted somebody else. And they forced him to take out the character he wanted, and they forced him to put in Black Widow. So you know what he did? He made a great movie with Black Widow in it for the first Avengers movie. Mm. That's not an apples to apples comparison, admittedly, but the principle's the same. So anyway, there's that. <clears throat> But yeah, man, I don't, again, I don't think Spider-Man 3 is like one of the worst films I've ever seen, but it is pretty bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Uh, James Wheeler sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you, James, for supporting us on that level. And he writes, hello, John, uh, will you bring a hat in case Austin Matthews scores a hat trick? Uh, I always bring a hat to a game. For those of you who don't know, um, there is a tradition in hockey. I know a lot of my American friends don't uh, understand or watch hockey that's fair but there is a tradition in hockey that when somebody if somebody scores three goals in one game it doesn't happen a lot but it happens they call that a hat trick now why it's called a hat trick i honestly don't know but they refer to some to one person scoring three goals in one game as a hat trick and now the tradition is when somebody on the home team scores a hat trick. The tradition is to take off your hat and throw it onto the ice. And then normally they have to, you know, pause the game for a bit as the ice crew comes out and scoops up all the hats. I always bring a hat to a hockey game. That being said, I have never once <coughs> had the opportunity to throw my hat on. I've never been to a game where somebody scored a hat trick. Mm. Let me rephrase. I've never been to a game where somebody on my team that I'm rooting for has scored a hat trick. But yep, I'm uh, I specifically and by the way, somebody's saying like, man, hats are expensive. Who was saying that? I think it was JS saying hats are expensive now. Yes, but I have a lot of hats and I keep some for the exclusive reason to bring them with me to hockey games. <laughs> so I don't grab my $50 lid. I, I grab like my 12 year old $8 hat that I just have sticking around in my closet. And I bring that to the hockey game. So if somebody on the Leafs scores a hat trick, I will be there to toss my hat on the ice. So damn right. I am man. Damn right. Thanks for that. James. I appreciate that. And it doesn't have to just be Austin Matthews. Anybody on the Leafs is perfectly fine. All right. Murray Reich writes, I saw on Disney Plus the 2015 documentary Four Falls of Buffalo, which discusses the history of the Bills losing four Super Bowls. Ouch. Definitely a watch. What was your memory of Kelly and Norwood? I I mean, listen, <clears throat> because I my hometown is the Hammer, Steel City, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. That's my home. Um, I wasn't born there. I was, I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh <clears throat> Uh, my mom and Sidney Crosby's mom went to the same school. Anyway, uh, so uh, growing up in Hamilton, it's only about an hour drive from Buffalo. You could be in Buffalo in about an hour from Hamilton. So the the NFL team that I uh, kind of, during my formative years that I was following, was the Buffalo Bills. And yeah, the Bills did something no team has done since. They went to four straight Super Bowls, and they didn't win a single one. <clears throat> and that sucks. That that's fine. But like I laugh at people, well, Buffalo sucks. They went to they lost in four Super Bowls. Buffalo was awesome. They got to four Super Bowls. And your team, unless you're a New England Patriots fan or a Kansas City Chiefs fan, your team has not done that. Anyway, so they got to four straight Super Bowls. Hall of Famer Jim Kelly. But here's the thing: the heartbreaker was the very first Super Bowl they got to. I think it was the first one. They were competing in the Super Bowl against the New York Giants, being coached by iconic legendary coach Bill Parcells. And it came down to a movie, a movie cinematic ending where Buffalo with the clock running down and they were behind, they marched down the field and as time was about to expire, they had the opportunity to kick a field goal to win the Super Bowl. The snap the kick by Scott Norwood, the kicker, missed. The clock ran out, and Buffalo lost the Super Bowl. It was a painful, painful, painful time to be a Buffalo Bills fan. 
But yeah, I look back on that era with great fondness, like great, great fondness. Like what what a record of success. Four straight times they won the AFC. And uh, I have not seen that. Uh, I have not seen it, this documentary, but it sounds like something I'd be interested in watching. Thank you for putting it on my radar, Murray. I appreciate that, man. Next up, <clears throat> wide right, wide right. Um, <laughs> words burned in my brain. Abe, 10 Alpha writes, hey, John, love the show. Thank you so, lo- so much. Green light one, Les Grossman spinoff or an Ari Gold TV spinoff show? That's easy. Les Grossman all day, every day. I had a lot of Ari Gold. Right? I had season and seasons and seasons and seasons of Ari Gold on Entourage. And Ari Gold is a fantastic character. Um, actually, it's kind of funny that you bring up Ari Gold because the uh, the actor who plays him... Help me out, guys, in live chat. Why am I freezing on his name? Uh, anyway, the actor who plays Ari Gold and was just literally talking to me the other day, like two or three days ago, Jeremy Piven. Thank you, Captain Wingsuit. Jeremy Piven. So... <clears throat> That and just told me that Jeremy Piven is coming to like the comedy store, uh, which is a big comedy club in LA. She's like, Do you want to go see Jeremy Piven do stand up? And I'm like, Maybe. So I can't remember when he's doing that, but we might. But anyway, yeah, listen, Ari Gold was a great TV character. Fabulous, 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 fabulous. But we only got one movie with Tom Cruise's Les Grossman. I would kill. To see a, Le- they've they've talked for a long time about doing a Les Grossman spinoff movie, a long time. I would kill to see that movie. I would absolutely kill to see that movie. Um, so yes, I I, I love the Ari Gold character, but I got year after year after year. I got plenty of Ari Gold, and Ari Gold is great. But I only had one time to watch a Les Grossman character. I want to see that, hundred percent. All right, uh, next up, good question though. Dr. Stinky writes, uh, hey, John, I just wanted to come in and say I love you guys. Thank you so much. And what you guys do, uh, you guys help me express my love for film. Love you guys. Keep bringing the awesome and helping people through tough times. Oh, thank you so much for that, man. I appreciate it. I know Dr. Stinky's been watching us and been a part of our community for a long time. Thank you so much for that, man. I really appreciate that. I love what we get to do every day. And I love that we have a community like this one to, to do it with. So thanks so much for that, dude. I appreciate that. All right. Ismail Montoya writes, Hey, John, I'm excited for Dune 2 this weekend. Uh, what do you look forward to for this movie to for this movie to elaborate? I say because I haven't read the book for part three. Ah, see, that's the thing. I, I've, I've read the books. <clears throat> I've seen the Sci-Fi Channel miniseries. I've seen the original Dune movie. So there's really not much that I don't know they're going to do. I would say the thing that I'm really excited about is after all the incredible dramatic and mythology building and character development and everything they did so beautifully in the first film, I'm ready to see them continue that, but then kick in this mind blowing epic scale action as well to add to what was already one of the best films in years with the first Dune to now add to that with this like mind blowing epic action. And one of the great things I've been hearing um, coming out of all the reviews and the reactions was that there is a lot of action in this, in this one. And so you add the mythology to that. I cannot wait. I, I just cannot wait. I can't wait to do my, I hope the movie doesn't disappoint me. Yes, Mel. I really hope it doesn't. All right. James Wheeler writes, <clears throat> have you ever seen the 1990 Captain America? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably 1991 with the red skull. <laughs> Remember the look? Let me see if I can re- find uh, the Red Skull. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find this or not. Oh my goodness, yes I can. If you think you can, you can. Let me see if I can bring this image up on screen for you guys. Oh my goodness, yep. Uh, behold, everybody, Red Skull. <laughs> and you know what? You know what? For 1990, that's not the worst. For 1990, for 1990, understanding they don't have, they didn't have the same magic uh, stuff that they had, you know, in the 2010s and the the 2020s to do stuff. That's not the worst you could have done. 
that's not the worst you could have done. But that, but that grin, the grin is killing me. The, the grin is, the grin is absolutely killing me. All right. <clears throat> Next up we go. Murray Reich writes, is rebel moon worse than Madam web? No rebel moon's bad. I mean, it's bad, but it's not, it's not Madam web bad. It's, I mean, it's pretty damn bad. Oh my God. Rebel moon is bad. It's so bad, but it is not Madam web bad. Uh, it, it, it had more going for it than, uh, uh, Rebel Moon had more upside than than Madam Web did. All right, next up, uh, YT writes, John, you shut your mouth. Halle Berry looked gorgeous. Oh, I no doubt. You're not going to get any arguments out of me about how positively and perfectly fine Halle Berry looked in Catwoman. You're not going to get any arguments from me. She just looked really fine in a not so good movie. I mean, um. <clears throat> But yeah, greatest Catwoman costume of all time, of all time, that costume. All right. Um, did you hear about Project XX? I don't know who wants this. Uh, no, I did not. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming this is would be a sequel to Project X. I had a fun time at Project X. True story about Project X. I don't, I don't know if I've ever told this story before. So, <clears throat> Anne and I uh, went to um, Nashville to go visit a buddy of mine who lives in Nashville, works with all the top music acts in the world, this guy. Anyway, and he and I have been friends since we were both really young. So Ann and I go out to Nashville to visit this buddy of mine. And while we're in Nashville, uh, we had an afternoon. He's like, hey, let's go see a movie. I'm like, yeah, let's go see a movie. So we went to go see Project X at this Nashville movie theater. And it was fun. I thought it was funny. I didn't think it's like one of the greatest comedies of all time or anything, but it was fun. It was an enjoyable little film, and um, I, I had a good time with it. <clears throat> but here's where it gets interesting. We come out of the movie theater and walk outside, and we look up. I'm like, huh, the sky is green. And a lot of storm clouds and all this kind of stuff. It wasn't, I mean, it was a little bit cloudy when we went in, but it, now it's like really cloudy and the sky is like green. And like five seconds after we walk outside and I notice that the sky is green, the air siren horns start going off. Like start going off. It's the tornado warnings. So my buddy Jeff goes, I think we better get back to my place. I'm like, I think we should. So we go back to my, my buddy Jeff's and he's got like this basement thing set up and we get there and Jeff's wife is down there and a couple of their neighbors like came out from their houses to come into Jeff's basement. And we spent the next couple hours with the TV turned on down in his basement watching his like 17 or something tornadoes touch down in Nashville, like some ridiculous number like that. Anyway, Whenever I hear about Project X, <laughs> that's why that pops into my head. I will just always associate that with having to scramble into a basement because there were tornadoes hitting. Something I've, I've never had to been worried about before. All right. Thanks for that, King Daddy Goat. And uh, yeah, I didn't hear about that, but I'm going to keep my eye open now for the Project XX. Okay. All right. Uh, Bob writes, Superman 4 is awful. But the concept of Superman dealing with nuclear war, Cold War issues, sounds like a great concept that needs better execution. Absolutely. We were just talking about that earlier, right? That so you can have a concept for a movie that's good, but if you don't execute it, it's pointless. Because here's the thing, and this is where I'm sure, for any of you guys who played Injustice Gods Among Us or read the, the comics of Injustice Gods Among Us, I'm sure they partly took influence from Superman for The Quest for Peace. Because... <clears throat> One of the interesting concepts of that movie, despite how bad it was, was that Superman is kind of struggling with the question, being the most powerful being on Earth, what responsibility does he have in a world that has nuclear weapons and they could kill themselves and all this kind of stuff? And so in the Quest for Peace, he basically makes the decision, he announces the world. I have made the decision, Superman, that I'm going to rid the world of nuclear weapons. Now... <clears throat> That, does Superman have the right to do that? <clears throat> does Superman have the right to do that? 
He is not our elected leader. Who is he to appoint himself as judge of the world? And but I mean, but it's but right. But the idea of getting rid of all the nuclear weapons is a pretty damn good idea. So it so it was a really neat concept that would set up a really cool tension, a really cool conflict, even if it's an internal conflict in Superman. Is it like? It's not my place. I am not their God. I am not their ruler. It's not my place to decide to rid the world of nuclear weapons. That's up for them to do for themselves. But at the same time, this is my home. Earth is my adopted home. I live here and I want to protect people. And these weapons are present an existential threat to our very existence. So it, it's, it could have been so very cool. It could have been so very, very cool. They just happened to make a really bad movie around it, <laughs> which was unfortunate. All right. Now let's see here. Next up, is, uh, uh, we got Mason Thurmond writes, is Shaq Steele worse than Madam Webb? I don't think so. I, you know, I would put it kind of on par because I'll say this, as bad as Shaquille O'Neal's steel is, and it's horrendous. I think we're lying to ourselves if we don't admit there's a little bit of fun in it right? There's a little bit of fun in, um, again, I'm not saying it's not terrible. It's terrible. But I would only go so far as to say is maybe it's as bad as Madam Web because I had no fun in Madam Web, like none. I had zero fun in that movie. And at least Steel puts a grin on our faces here and there and, and it has a little bit of fun, a little bit of fun. All right. <clears throat> Next up, we go to Ramon, who writes, Marcel, the shell with shoes on, more accurate example than Lego. I mean, yeah, but I mean, at the same time, you just come up, you just need an adorable little character. And so well, what about a little shell with feet and shoes? That's cute and adorable, but you're right. It's another example of you can have a very weird, odd, maybe even stupid concept, but if you write a great character and make it endearing and put a, a heartfelt story into it, it can work. So yeah, I, I'm with you on that, Ramon. I, I can agree with you on that one. All right. Uh, only have two questions left here. Uh, next up, we got David Cushmore who writes, do you think that The Rock will betray the bloodline at WrestleMania 40? Do you think Cody Rhodes will beat Reigns at WrestleMania 40? I don't care. I don't really follow wrestling. I mean, I watch WrestleMania every year. I usually watch WrestleMania and like one other like big major pay-per-view per year. Like I, when I was younger, I watched wrestling all the time, like religiously, but I haven't really followed it a lot much. I actually watch a little bit more AEW these days. And even that's not much, but you know, Nigel uh, does the color commentary on AEW. And so I, I will watch it just so I know in my own head, I'm supporting Nigel a little bit. Um, but, uh, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not following it. I don't, I don't give a crap. <laughs> Really, I will watch WrestleMania. I will watch it, but I, I have no vested thing in, about who might win or who's going to betray who or who's going to do do what. Um, no, Brandon, not Nigel Thornberry, Nigel McGuinness. Nigel McGuinness. Um, uh, he's been dating like Anne's best friend, Corey, who you guys know. I've had Corey on my show many, many, many times. Uh, he's been dating uh, Nigel. She's been dating Nigel for like five years now or might even be longer than that. So anyway, um, that's it. All right. Final question of the day today uh, comes to us by Damaris Love, who says, I stand by Lord and Miller doing Plastic Man. Yeah, you, uh, Damaris brought that up on the John Campy show a little bit earlier today. I, listen, I'd be down. I'd totally be down. That would be a very expensive movie to make because Plastic Man, very, very expensive movie to make. Uh, that being said... Um, it's such a fascinating character, truly one of the most powerful characters in DC and Lord and Miller doing that character would be really cool. I think I lean more towards Rob's idea of Lord Miller doing a booster gold and blue beetle movie. I think Lord Miller would be a terrific match for that, but I love the idea of them doing a plastic man film. hundred percent. I love the idea of them doing that. I think that would be really, really cool. All right, guys. And that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campia Open Mic Show. Thank you so much for being here and making this little show part of your day. 
Big special thank you to all of you guys who dropped by and participated and sent in those questions. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported my channel as you did it. And everybody who's involved with my channel, thank you guys so much for your support. Don't forget, tomorrow on the John Campus Show, me, Robert Meyer Burnett, uh, Jonathan Voico, Ray Ora, we'll all be back in here. Looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, that's about it for now. Uh, we're like less than 24 hours away from Avatar The Last Airbender coming out. I'm very Maybe we'll get lucky and Netflix will drop it a day early. They probably won't. But I'm very, very hopeful that they will. Anyway, that'll do it for me for now, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.